what I thought I'd give you is just sort of an overview of um, kind of where we are in, in the surgical questions and technique around pelvic lymph node dissection at surgery. I'm not going to do a ton of technique for this audience, but some of the key uh, lessons learned. And then we'll have, uh, you know, next talk will be on radiation approaches and then a couple other topics. Um, so I don't have any disclosures as uh, I'm actually an AUA journal editor, so we're not allowed to have any during our term. Um, so that simplifies that. Um, just some key background. Um, if you look at like population-based studies in the U.S., uh, lymph node dissections are typically omitted in about half or more of robotic prostates. Some of that was the learning curve when people were learning and they wanted to keep get the case finished if it wasn't necessary. Uh, a kind of an oddity of our U.S. circumstances is that the billing codes are the same whether or not you take out two lymph nodes or 22 lymph nodes. So you don't get any credit for taking out more. Uh, if, again, if you look at community practice, the average yields uh, for positive nodes are typically less than 5%, even in high risk. So the conclusion, if you keep looking at that topic, is that we don't do a lot of lymph node dissections and we don't really do it that well when we do it overall. Now, some of the interest in this came from uh, Urs, the late Urs Struder's practice uh, in Bern, Switzerland, uh, when they kind of learned a little bit more about the drainage pattern. So once you learn the extended template, if you look in the upper right where there's the Roman numeral one, when you're just in the obturator fossa, that's a standard node dissection. Extended gets you at least into zone two, if not more. And that typically doubles your yield, and about half of the unique lymph nodes you uncover are in that hypogastric zone. Uh, later, they did some uh, lymphocentigraphy studies that, if you look at the green dots in that middle figure, uh, if you then go back to the template, you're really only pulling out about 25% of the lymph node drainage in a standard approach, and you get it to maybe 75% extended. You really can't get all the lymph nodes surgically, or you would turn the patient into a kind of a cadaver experiment. So uh, that's probably, in large part, uh, why it's not really curative, as we'll get to. Different than other diseases that go more sequentially, which allow for, you know, sentinel node type strategies um, that just don't work in this t tumor as well. So, and then in terms of global efforts, there are a number of tables. You can see Parton, Briganti, and others that use different sources to predict the odds of a patient having positive nodes. It still ends up being somewhat of an empirical trigger point. You're going to say, or if you're over 3% yield or 5% or 7%, it's kind of largely made up what your trigger point would be. Um, and you know, the bottom figure is an actual Urs Studer uh, node dissection. Uh, he really learned how to clean it out and look like an anatomy uh, drawing. So I did a lot of work early in my career on the robotic lymph node technique. We made a lot of observations on how to expose the nodes robotically. Some of this was just sort of a, the challenge of it all. A lot of open surgeons from 20 years ago would get up at meetings like this and say that you could never do a good lymph node dissection robotically, and we're like, okay, challenge accepted. So here we go. Um, there are some a certain really areas that are a little bit tricky when you don't have a medical student with a retractor to just kind of hold something out of the way, but you can, you can find your way through all of these um, areas, whether it's the... Uh, like the, we found these old diagrams called the Triangle of Marceau that's right against the uh, iliac uh, takeoffs. And it did help that some products, like I use a product called Anchor Tissue Retrieval, so you can come in with an endo bag and take out, like, so you can basically do mapping studies if you want to, you're not having to waste a bag every time. So you see the, the sort of the surgical references in the bottom left. But on the right-hand side, the early endpoints uh, to compare, a st our standard, our experience was a yield of about eight lymph nodes and 3% positive. Early extended, we're immediately up to 14 lymph nodes with 17% positive. As we got better and did more mapping, you could drive the yield up to mid-20s. Um, but look at that bottom point. If you then segregate the patients by risk groupings, and we were, you know, 15 years ago, we were doing some low-risk surgery. They basically had 0% positive nodes. Intermediate 12 and high risk 33%. So quite a jump from intermediate to high risk uh, in terms of the yield. Um, so again, a checklist of where we are now. Yes, you need to have a nomogram in mind of what where your cut trigger points are going to be. We know that the extended node dissection does take a lot of time. Uh, in my hands, it's about 40, 45 minutes, and it's really slow for trainees. They usually take 45 minutes per side until they kind of really get into the rhythm. Uh, of, of how to do it well. 
Um, and again, there's the standard issue with the billing codes. So positive nodes are, again, highly prognostic. Now, again, some patients by the nomogram would be selected not to have a node dissection, but then when you get their prostate path back, they've been upgraded or upstaged, and you, then they would have met criteria for node dissection. So we kind of made up the term lymph node in X regret, meaning you wished you have done it. Actually, it turns out you rarely have to run back on those patients. We've done it on a few cases, but usually they have T3 disease, and it's probably going to be something you're going to salvage with radiation more than return to surgery. Superimposed on this is some interesting parallel lessons in PET imaging. On the left part of that diagram, you know, when I was a, tra a trainee, you, you know, if you had high-risk localized disease, you had local therapy. If you had clinically detected nodes, you know, for a while that was just ADT then radiation and selective surgery may play a role. So now you have this middle ground of, you know, clinical molecularly detected positive nodes and which side do they gravitate toward is still kind of a work in progress. Um, this just to show the main sensitivity specificity in terms of strengths and weaknesses. If you look at multiparametric MRI and then a study of gallium PSMA, sensitivities go 22 to 48 percent. Specificities are high either way. That's a very specific communication with the patient. It basically means if they have a positive PET, it's probably real. Yes, there's such thing as a false positive, but not a lot, basically. Um, whereas sensitivity capture is, you know, maybe 50% at best. It's probably volumetric, meaning the very small one or two millimeter lymph nodes probably are not being detected. Um, and then this paper kind of looks at the, uh, the Kaplan-Meier outcome both ways, so it's certainly better if you aggregate a group of patients that are PET negative versus positive. You can see a very uh, clear distinction in, in a relapse rate. But this is a probably, and this would drive some of my thinking, if they have, if they're then known surgically to have positive nodes, if it's one to two versus more than two, you can see a very substantial split between the blue line and the red line. So. Usually if, if we get someone with conventionally negative imaging, but maybe they have one node on PET imaging, especially if it's in a zone that I can get to with a regular template, I'll probably still offer surgery. But, you know, if it's multiple nodes, we probably fall back onto more of an ADT radiation type of um, direction. Again, the therapeutic question has been looked at in other ways. This is a large data accumulation study here. No nodes versus nodes superimposed lines. This one's on BCR-free survival and uh, clinic uh, cancer-specific uh, mortality rates. So prognostic, but not really therapeutic. Uh, this is our own internal data. Again, not randomized, but it's propensity weighted. Again, whether or not we did standard or extended, the, uh, the true oncologic outcomes were basically the same despite substantially different yields and positive node yields. So I did spend some time a couple of years ago with AUA on the guidelines panel, and we did want to challenge this question. Um, there was, and really it ended up being one paper you see there at the, in the bottom of Fasadi, systematic review of 44 studies, over 200,000 patients, and basically they looked at all possible ways of influence of node dissections, and really the only things that were positive on side effects were lymphocele, everything else was fairly neutral, and, and basically there was no clear uh, oncologic uh, outcome gain. Um, and just a quick plug for how the um, panel works. You know, every guidelines panel is different. AUA basically starts with a multidisciplinary uh, panel at 12 o'clock, and then at 2 o'clock, there's an initial involvement of the panel to go over the key questions. So we had several on, on the lymph node surgical question in this go round. And then we actually kind of take a break, and they have a, have a professional evidence review team that actually they spent almost six months. Um, searching out the whole list of key questions, and they write a massive review document that's quite valuable. Then the panel kind of wakes up, and you get their evidence statements, and you can write one or multiple guideline statements to answer the questions posed. And then it does go a number of peer reviews, including external publication, and then they're supposed to repeat every two to three years, depending. So the, the, the staff effort on these guidelines is quite substantial. I heard it quoted once. There are about 200,000 in effort for every guideline. So, so very rigorous and happy to do a part of one. So I pulled out the ones most relevant to this discussion, uh, number seven, basically saying that, yes, uh, with patients at risk for metastatic disease, you can use molecular imaging. That's basically exactly how the uh, phrase, indications phrasing are, are done. Um, 
number 20 is the concept of um, pelvic lymphadenectomy providing staging information, which could guide future management, but does not have documented uh, consistent improvement in cancer-specific outcomes. Uh, 21 is, again, the, the, the nomogram referencing, and then, you know, where, where most of us have stood on this, on 22, is if, if they meet criteria for no dissection, we do extended, otherwise we do none. And so standard has kind of fallen off if you really follow the evidence. So this is kind of how the management translates for me for low risk. Uh, middle column would be the surgical discussion, and right-hand column would be the no discussion. So low risk, you're trying not to do either one, right? Um, if they're favorable, intermediate, yes, surgery, with the comparators being surveillance in some cases, radiation, and there's a lot of, you know, whole lectures you can give on anterior uh, pelvic fascia sparing approaches to really narrow the gaps on uh, continence uh, side effects, but essentially no lymph node dissection. Now, if they're more in unfavorable, intermediate, yes, again, to, to prostatectomy, versus radiation, you, you do typically have less room to do all the sort of de-radicalization of the surgery. Um, and, but in most cases, you, if you do the nomograms, you still don't need uh, lymph node dissection. What triggers it, you need a pretty big MR primary, like Pirates 5 lesion and a lot of Gleason 4-3, that might overlap into it. And so that's kind of what the uh, fourth row is, unfavorable intermediate with larger volumes. So yes, you're doing surgery with nodes versus radiation and hormones. And then higher locally advanced yes nodes, and then it's sort of surgery discussed versus RT and extended um, uh, ADT. Um, now, again, we, we talked about the idea of that does the staging help? And actually, believe it or not, on the AUAG panel, the medical oncologist actually didn't want us to totally dismiss nodes despite therapeutic issues because of the management issues. So, for example, like if you then look at the guidelines released last year on salvage therapy, Number 16, for patients with pathologic node disease, being treated in postoperative RT clinicians should include ADT rather than um, RT alone. Uh, if they're known to be node negative, sometimes they could do uh, RT alone. Uh, if they're pathologic N1 or PET positive, that would increase the need for pelvic field radiation with ADT. And there's certainly trials um, in our place and others looking at, you know, duets of ADT treatments for these type patients. So it can actually kind of direct some of the salvage efforts about um, RT versus combined um, salvage. So that's probably its most valuable oncologic benefit. Um, so, and it does affect my life in, in a good way. So on the left side, if I just have to do three prostates in a day with no nodes, we'll whip through, we'll be done at four or five. If you get a swing room, you can get even luckier. Once you stating, start adding node dissections, you know, you're adding 45 minutes per case, so 90 minutes if two people need it. And then on the third column, if everybody needs nodes in a day plus surgical hostility challenges, that's a long day and the red face is how I feel at eight o'clock at night, basically. So, and that was it, all right.